what in the world? I mean, we're going to talk about injuries and how it's going to affect every NFL team moving forward this season, but what the heck happened? Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to a new episode of Time to Football coming to you from our studio in arguably the chokiest city in all of America, Atlanta, Georgia. I am your host, Hassan Khan, and man, it sucks being a Falcons fan at times. I'll take that back. It sucks being a Falcons fan in the fourth quarter because in quarter one and quarter two, maybe a little bit of quarter three, it's wonderful. Life is great. And then all of a sudden, Atlanta has to Atlanta. Here's a crazy stat for you guys. Teams that have scored 39 points and have not committed a turnover have won their games 440 times and never lost. They're 440 to zero. That's the record of teams that score 39 points and don't commit a turnover. But then, as always, the streak needs to be ruined. The Atlanta Falcons came in like Brock Lesnar defeating The Undertaker at WrestleMania and decided to end that streak and be the one and 440 and one. Why? Because Atlanta has to Atlanta. I should have known. I should have known that being a Falcons fan, I have got to keep my expectations low. That's just how it is. You know, the Super Bowl 28 to 3. Yeah, that was, oh gosh, that was heartbreaking. And then, all of a sudden, I I decided to give Dan Quinn some grace and thought, okay, well, let's not fire him. I I really do believe that he is a a great coach and he's going to turn things around. It's just the defense that needs to get better and yada, yada. After yes, uh, last week's game, I I honestly don't know at this point. I don't. I'm so glad that I'm not in charge of making those decisions, those front office decisions. But if Arthur Blank were to fire Dan Quinn, uh, as a Falcons fan, I, I hate it because he took us to the Super Bowl. But also as a Falcons fan, I wouldn't hate it just because of the uh, lack of consistency when it comes later on in that game. We had the onside kick legend, Young Wei Koo, on our team. But little did I know that there was another onside kick legend, and that wasn't Greg the Leg that recovered that onside kick or kicked that onside kick. That is that legend. It's actually the Atlanta Falcons special teams as well. That is the onside kick legend for any team that they face. Allowing that ball to go past 10 yards and letting the Cowboys recover that. And, you know, you could blame it on Hayden Hurst. You could blame it on whoever was in that pile in charge of those hands teams to make that onside kick recovery but at this point it just falls on coaching I don't know I don't know what's going to happen but oof it sucks and now for the rest of this episode I have to wear this Atlanta Falcons shirt I could take it off right now but there's children watching but we welcome you guys to a new episode of time to football like we mentioned we're going to be talking about uh injuries and how it's affecting Every NFL team moving forward because, oh my freaking goodness, the injuries that happened in week two of the NFL. And it's just not just injuries to no-name players, but notable players as well that makes an impact for each organization that has been injured. So this is going to have amazing ramifications. Is that how you say it? Ramifications on the whole entire season could cost some teams some playoff spots as well. So we're going to dive right into it, but first we have to get into our weekly award, the most prestigious award on the show. We have to name Week 2's Hungriest Player of the Week. Hungriest Player of the Week, the one that wanted it the most. Atlanta Falcons head coach Dan Quinn told their special teams to let the ball roll past 10... Okay, all right, I'm done talking about the Falcons... We'll move on. Just kidding. But I will occasionally be drinking out of this Atlanta Falcons Rise Up cup that I have. (sighs) The bitter, bitter taste of defeat. Kansas City Chiefs kicker Harrison Bucker. Man, oh man, the number of 58-yard field goals this man had to convert. In the middle of the game, converting a 58-yard field goal, tying uh, a franchise record 
for the longest field goal in Kansas City Chiefs history, setting a career long for him in that game. And then later on in the game, when the score was 17 to 20, he had to convert a field goal to send this game to overtime. And then he kicked the game winning field goal in overtime. And it was another 58 yards. Converted the first one? Nope, didn't count. Second one? Nope, didn't, ca- didn't count. The Chargers called a timeout. Then the third one converted it, and that one counted. Three straight 58-yard field goals and four total in that game, but only two of them counted, showing that he wanted it the most for the Kansas City Chiefs and leading them to a 23-20 victory over the LA Chargers. And that is why Harrison Butker is your Week 2 Hungriest Player of the Week. Something about the Hungriest Player of the Week, before we move on from this award, I have been doing this award since 2013, all right? I created this award, and then all of a sudden, from last year, the check down. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but it's the NFL's, it's a side Instagram where they talk more about the football culture of the NFL and not so much the stats and all that stuff. It's more like a funny, lighthearted version of the the NFL's Instagram account. 1.2 million followers on Instagram, like they're, Doing a hell of a job. They do an amazing job. Love their content. But last year, they brought this award into their Instagram called the Hungriest Player of the Week. And I'm thinking to myself, hold on. I created that award. I've been commenting every single time they post these Hungriest Player of the Weeks. Week one, it was Josh Jacobs for his three touchdowns against Carolina. They're partnered with Snickers. So what they do is... They say Josh Jacobs is the hungriest player. He had the best performance. So they give him this whole gold chain with a Snickers logo and say that he was hungry. And then in week two, they gave it to Aaron Jones. And I've been commenting in all of these posts saying, check down. This is copyright infringement. You stole this award from me. A small guy, a small YouTuber, you guys stole that award from me. So do me a favor. If you guys are time to football fans, go to the check down, their Instagram account. Go to all their hungriest award uh, posts that they made. And comment down below in the comments. Just say, hey, Time to Football created this award. Tag Time to Football. Moving on. I'm done being salty. Done with the Falcons. Done with this whole check down copyright infringement. Let's talk about a little bit more saltiness for you guys. For your fantasy owners. And owning these players that were injured. Oh my gosh. There were so many stars that were injured this past week, like Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, Nick Bosa. We're going to talk about all of these guys. What we're going to do is we're going to split it up to talk about NFC injuries and then AFC injuries. And then towards the end of the show, as always, we'll be answering some fantasy football questions. But let's start with some NFC injuries. Starting off with the first team, the New York Giants. There were a couple of uh, stars on that New York Giants that were injured this past week, with the most notable being Saquon Barkley. It was one play where he kind of landed on his arm awkwardly, looked like he hyperextended his elbow, and then it was maybe the play after or two plays after where he tore his ACL and he's out for the rest of the season. It was confirmed this past Monday. But... He was the lifeline and the cornerstone in the face of that New York Giants franchise. Everything that that Giants franchise has to do is built around Saquon Barkley. And now that he's out for the season, any hope, any glimmer of hope or any chance that they thought they would have of making at least a wild card spot in the playoffs, I know it's kind of a reach even with Saquon Barkley, but any hope that they had, even make that additional seventh wild card spot that they're introducing this year. It's out of the water now because Saquon Barkley was that guy that could have helped them, and now he's not going to be in that New York Giants offense for the rest of, for the rest of 2020. Now, what they do in response is that they bring in Devontae Freeman and they sign him to a $3 million deal, which is kind of weird because he was asking for $7 million or more, and teams wouldn't offer him that much at the point that his agent was like, all right, I'm done. We offered you... I got you a one-year, $4 million contract deal from the Seattle Seahawks, and you declined it? All right, I'm done with you, Devontae. And then he signs $3 million knowing that maybe this is the only shot that he's going to get to play in 2020. I doubt that this is going to be a big move for the New York Giants and really shifting their whole entire offense. Because with Devontae Freeman, trust me, I just ran about the Atlanta Falcons. 
And trust me, I know how Devontae Freeman operates just from watching him every single game that he was with the Atlanta Falcons. Great talent, but somewhere along the way, I don't know if it was the offensive line of the Falcons or if it was him losing a step, decided to kind of fizzle out and not be as good as he used to be. He's going to be splitting carries. He's never been a true three down back in Atlanta, at least, not doubting his talent in that he can't be. But he's going to be splitting carries with Deion Lewis and Wayne Gallman being in there, with Deion Lewis being more so in the passing uh, game and receiving back, which, if you look at the New York Giants, they're going to be down in games often. So Deion Lewis is going to be in that lineup heavily. Maybe, in some games, is going to get more snaps than Devontae Freeman. So I doubt that Devontae is going to get behind that offensive line more than four yards a carry. I, I think he's going to get somewhere between three and a half to four yards, but maybe 15 touches a game. But for you guys that are fantasy football players, I don't think that Devontae Freeman is going to do much. I mean, it's worth adding him just because the running back crop and the waiver wire is pretty, pretty thin. So it's worth it, but I don't think he's going to make that much of an impact for the New York Giants and helping them, helping them lead uh, the Giants to a playoff spot. Another guy on the Giants team that was injured was Sterling Shepard. He is out with turf toe. So that's going to be a few weeks that he's going to be missing time. You probably heard this many times, but if you haven't, here's an interesting stat for you guys. Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton, Evan Ingram, Saquon Barkley, uh, Golden Tate, all these big name players, playmakers that they have on that Giants team have never played with each other I think they were close to this season they might have played uh, maybe in week one was the first time that they were all together and all the weapons were healthy and they could play but then uh, I think it was week two. Oh no actually no in week one Golden Tate I believe Golden Tate was hurt so they never played with each other all those weapons so you always talk about oh Darius Slayton has so much potential oh Golden Tate has so much potential Sterling Shepard has so much potential Evan Ingram, we don't know how this team is going to operate with all these people together. And unfortunately, with Sterling Shepard out and Saquon Barkley, especially for the rest of the season, it's not going to happen again this season. That won't become a reality. So what this does mean is for you guys in fantasy football that are owners of Golden Tate, are owners of Darius Slayton or Evan Ingram, this could be beneficial for you because the Giants, like I mentioned, are going to be down in games a lot. They're going to be passing it a lot. It's going to be a lot of weight on the on the shoulders of Daniel Jones to be the man to step up and help this Giants offense. Now that Saquon is down, that does mean more targets for those other guys. But like I said, I think that this these injuries with Shepard and Saquon is going to be hurtful to the New York Giants to the point that they they might be a bottom five team in the NFL. I don't know if they're going to be the worst team in New York that may belong to the Jets. As long as Adam Gase is there, oh my goodness. But for now, the Giants, things are not looking good for Big Blue. The next team, the San Francisco 49ers. And this franchise probably took the biggest hit out of any other team this past week with all of the injuries. I mean, you talk about the superstar cornerstone defensive end and Nick Bosa out for the season with another torn ACL. Seven torn ACLs in week two. According to Adam Schefter, like he mentioned on Monday Night Football, he has never seen Anything like that in a very, very long time with seven players tearing their ACL in one one day. Not just one week, one day. Ridiculous to think about. But Nick Bosa is that biggest name and that defense is going to suffer. All of a sudden, you got to think to yourself, with him out and then Sherman potentially being out for another couple more weeks, is this team the the, the best defense in the NFL? Right now, that title belongs to the Baltimore Ravens, but are they even con contenders to be a top five, maybe even top 10 defense in the NFL? I mean, if you look at the the run game and the passing game as well, they've been getting, I want to say, torn up. They still have flashes of being a decent defense, but 
they've been giving up some plays that they usually wouldn't be giving up in 2019. So this defense has taken a hit, got rid of DeForest Buckner as well on that line, and man, Solomon Thomas as well, another torn ACL. Goodness. I, I don't think this defensive line or this San Francisco defense is going to be the same. And for you guys that do play fantasy football, don't be scared if you have a player that's established and is good, but you're like, oh man, they're facing the 49ers though. Hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to start that player. So Nick Bosa, Solomon Thomas, this is going to be a, a, a big hit to the 49ers team. Are they going to get back to that? Super Bowl status that they were a couple years ago? Probably not. Will they make the playoffs? That remains to be seen. With someone like Nick Bosa or Solomon Thomas out on that defense, you could argue, okay, well, maybe the offense can carry this this team. Not so much. With Raheem Mostert and Tevin Coleman, their top two running backs out as well, that's a big hurt as well. Mostert, a minimum of one to two weeks. Most. Uh, more, more than likely, he's not going to be playing against the New York Giants. And instead, the ball is going to be given to Jarek McKinnon and Jeff Wilson because Tevin Coleman suffered a worse injury than Raheem Mostert. He had a knee injury, and he's going to be out for minimum four weeks, already placed on IR. So that's a big step to ask for that uh, San Francisco running backs the next up with Jarek McKinnon and Jeff Wilson, which McKinnon has been looking great and might not even skip a beat, the, the 49ers offense, at least behind that offensive line. But Mostert is obviously the most talented back in that 49ers offense, and it makes a big difference as far as having a talent like that out of the game, and you got to rely on your third and fourth string. So remains to be seen. Jarek McKinnon, good talent, has definitely earned the right to uh, play more snaps with the way he's been playing, especially in the receiving game, but... That's that's definitely a, a big hit when you lo- when you lose your top two running backs. George Kittle is still recovering uh, from a left knee sprain, and what Kyle Shanahan said about him is that he wants to wait until Kittle has the opportunity to play it on natural grass instead of turf, so that it won't be that much pressure and that much uh, intensity on that knee, and he can recover better. So, could he play this week against the New York Giants physically? Yes, possibly, but is he going to be forced out there because of the lack of natural grass on that field? Shanahan would rather just wait and look ahead at the season in the long run and make sure that Kittle is fully healthy because, hey, they're perfectly fine with Jordan Reed. Seven receptions, 50 yards, and two touchdowns out of that guy. Where did he come from? But they're going to be waiting for that. So, Jimmy Garoppolo is another one of those guys that he wants to wait on potentially playing on natural grass because his injury is a high right ankle sprain. And the reason why that's so important and critical is because if it was a left uh, ankle sprain and not his right foot, then he might be projected to come back maybe a week sooner than usual. But because it is his right ankle and his planting foot because he's right-handed, so whenever he takes a snap, out of the shotgun or even out of center, especially a lot of pressure is going to be put on that back foot to stop set in the pocket. And even to throw deep balls, he's going to be using that back foot a lot. So that's big for Jimmy Garoppolo. The fact that it was in his right foot as opposed to his left foot, but he's more more than likely uh, missing this week against the New York giants. And the start is going to be given to Nick Mullen. So Overall team outlook with all of these injuries happening to Solomon Thomas, Nick Bosa, Raheem Mostert, Tevin Coleman, Jimmy Garoppolo, George Kittle, Richard Sherman already being out, Debo Samuel on IR. Gosh, that's a lot of names. I I doubt that this team is going to get back to the Super Bowl just outside looking in right now because that's, I know that a lot of these guys may come back in the next week or two, but man, two games is critical in the NFL that could determine between a bye week or a wild card spot. So for the 49ers, it's going to be tough, especially in that division with Russell Wilson, who looks like an MVP. Now, uh, Kyler Murray in that cliff Kingsbury offense, taking a step up and Murray being an MVP candidate as well. From the looks of it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for the 49ers. 
Moving on to the AFC, the two teams that we're going to be talking about in the AFC are the Denver Broncos and the LA Chargers, both in the AFC West. Let's start with the Denver Broncos being the team that's just in that similar situation as the San Francisco 49ers, suffering injuries to multiple players, notable players, in the same day. Drew Locke being the biggest one of them, the quarterback, suffering a strained rotator cuff out two weeks minimum. So what did the Broncos do? They go out to the free agent market and they sign arguably the, uh, in my opinion, arguably the greatest quarterback. Uh, I, I would probably not like Peyton Manning or Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, not like in that category. Uh, so not not top five, but like probably top fifteen. Blake Bortles and they sign him to back up Jeff Jeff Driscoll. So Driscoll will be starting in the time being. But Drew Locke is going to be out for a minimum of two weeks. Bortles gets signed. Don't even bring up Colin Kaepernick and get political on this channel in the comments. I don't, this, whatever your political stance is, don't bring it. Okay. We don't want that negative energy. Okay. Be positive. Colin Kaepernick, I'd still think that he does deserve a shot in the NFL, but don't even advocate or bring up any political stuff in the comments. Okay. Don't even start that. Be positive. So how does this affect this team, though? Well, this offense going into 2020 made a lot of uh, moves and transactions and draft picks to build around Drew Locke. They bring in Melvin Gordon to be that one-two punch with Philip Lindsay, which Philip Lindsay, and if you want to talk about another injury, is hurt. So they got to rely on Melvin Gordon and Royce Freeman. They bring in Jerry Judy as their first-round pick. They bring in K.J. Hamler as a second-round pick. So back-to-back receivers are drafted to help out Drew Locke. So for you guys that are playing fantasy football, K.J. Hamler might also be a fantasy football sneaky stash on your bench. And I'm going to explain why in just a second. But Drew Locke, with him being out, with this offense being built around this guy that has a potential to break out, Jeff Driscoll, for at least the next couple weeks, is going to have to fill in that role. And can he fill in in that passing game and take over for Drew Locke and have this team not miss a beat in the time being? They're 0-2, so they've really got to step up with their game in that category. But they had some pretty tough matchups against the Tennessee Titans and the Steelers. But Jeff Driscoll, if you want to look at the, the eye test perspective, he didn't look terrible against the Steelers, actually had a pretty good showing. So uh, this Broncos coaching staff may have a lot of confidence in Jeff Driscoll. But even though Jeff Driscoll was in that game and he looked somewhat decent, Cortland Sutton, your number one wide receiver, is out for the year. This passing game was supposed to be good. It was supposed to be great. And it still has a chance to be with Jerry Judy, but... Cortland Sutton, a thousand yard receiver, was supposed to be a good complement, was supposed to carry the load, and Jerry Judy was supposed to be that number two receiver. Now he's going to have to transition in to be that number one. And then at number two, Tim Patrick, Deshaun Hamilton, we saw in the past year or two, those guys couldn't get it done. You drafted KJ Hamler in the second round. For you guys that are fantasy football players, you may want to stash him on your bench because he could be seeing. Or actually, it's a given. He's going to be seeing a, a, a lot more targets. He saw seven targets once Cortland Sutton was out of the game. So he was put into that offense immediately and saw work immediately. So KJ Hamler could be could be a good sneaky pickup. But this offense with Drew Locke and Cortland Sutton and Philip Lindsay, those were the three main guys that were still on this team in 2020 that were starting in 2019. Then everybody else pretty much newcomers. If you want to talk about starters on that team with Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler and Melvin Gordon that they signed a free agency. What is the team outlook though with Cortland Sutton, Andrew Locke out? 0-2 start against Tennessee, against Pittsburgh. Tough schedule, yeah, but it's not promising for uh, Vic Fangio and that Denver Broncos offense. So, I mean, if I'm Vic Fangio, you know, avoid... $100,000 $100,000 fines, keep that mask on, and just rebuild for the future. But I, I I know his mentality is to keep on playing until you know, you're know you completely out of it, completely out of playoff contention. And there were a lot of 
questionable decisions that he made, especially in that game against Tennessee. Why didn't he just call a timeout when uh, Tennessee was marching down the field? Then you could have gotten the ball back, which you locked with some time left on the clock. You could have gotten to field goal range yourself, but uh, I know that he's gotten a lot of heat from the media from that. But uh, as far as an overall team perspective for 2020, I, I just, these in- injuries don't help at all. A team that was promising to be one of the better offenses or breakout offense at least in 2020, not going to be happening. So uh, unfortunately for the uh, Denver Broncos, going to have to move on from that in 2020. You're just going to have to rebuild. The last thing that we want to talk about, the LA Chargers, also in the AFC West. Only one notable injury to this team that we want to discuss. I understand Justin Jackson is a notable name, but they found a replacement in Josh Kelly, so they're good in that department. But they also might be good in this player's department as well, Tyrod Taylor. The noble, the notable name that we want to talk about, he's out indefinitely because of an injection that he had. The starting quarterback, Tyrod Taylor. I just want to reiterate, like Anthony Lynn keeps on reiterating, keeps on letting us know that Tyrod Taylor is the starting quarterback. Not anymore, my friend. Justin Herbert is going to come in and be the starter for uh, arguably maybe even the remainder of the season. So Tyrod Taylor had this injection. It was a painkiller injection for his ribs. The team doctor injected him with this painkiller injection and accidentally punctured his lung, which sounds so painful. And he's out indefinitely because we thought he was going to miss maybe one week, maybe two games. No, he's going to be out for a while. So the NFLPA is going to be investigating this. Going to be seeing if there's any people that needs to lose their practice in medicine. Maybe if there's going to be some lawsuits going on. Mistakes happen. I understand. So let's not put too much weight on that. But the the reality is, for a football perspective, Justin Herbert is going to be the starting quarterback for the LA Chargers. How good is Justin Herbert? I mean, he looked fantastic against the, the defending Super Bowl champions, the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, you throw for 300 yards and one touchdown in your rookie debut against the defending champs? That's enough in my eyes to go ahead and say, hey, you have the green light. You are given the reins. You are, you are our starting quarterback because you can only get better from this point forward. And I think a lot of NFL fans think the same way. Justin Herbert should be the starting quarterback, even if Tyrod Taylor were to be healthy and were to be capable to, to, to play because of that performance or from that performance that Herbert had. It's enough to convince us. There are those group of people, though. There's this group of people every single year that will say that Justin Herbert, nah, man, he's not ready to play. He needs to develop. He needs to sit and learn. He needs to take notes on the bench. He's just not ready to play. At this point, yeah, you have no choice, but for you guys that are saying that he is not ready to play, maybe true, maybe he isn't, but for you guys to refer to the sitting and learning theory, oof, mm, you're going to get me started on this one. All right, so I've been talking about this theory, <laughs> oh gosh, for so long on this YouTube channel. The sitting and learning theory for a quarterback is the stupidest theory out there I mean it sounds smart hey why don't you just sit and you learn you take notes study some film yeah why not learn some tips and tricks but it's statistically proven that if a quarterback starts at least 11 games the rookie season more likely than not they go on to have a successful second season don't believe me here are some examples Andrew Luck Russell Wilson Matt Ryan, Ryan Tannehill, Mitch Trubisky, Blake Bortles, Marcus Mariota, Derek Carr, Jameis Winston, Carson Wentz, Dak Prescott, Andy Dalton. The list goes on and on and on. Most notably, or recently, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, in this trend, having successful second seasons. Because they started the majority of their games through rookie season. You could be saying, well, like Blake Bortles, who, like I said earlier, is arguably... I would say maybe not top 10, probably top 15 greatest quarterback of all time. Guys like Blake Bortles or Mitch Trubisky or uh, Marcus Mariota, those guys aren't really having success nowadays. Well, that's because of how good they are as a quarterback, how talented they are. You're either good or you're not. It doesn't matter when you start in the NFL, you're going to be good. For you guys, I keep on saying that you need to sit and learn. Use the examples of, oh, Patrick Mahomes or... uh, Aaron Rodgers, maybe even Lamar Jackson. Listen, 
Those guys were going to be good no matter what. It didn't matter when they started. Patrick Mahomes did not learn much sitting 15 games behind Alex Smith. Okay, Lamar Jackson did not learn much sitting nine games behind Joe Flacco. You're either talented or you're not. Those guys are talented, Aaron Rodgers, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, because of their physical attributes. And their physical attributes, they did not learn from the veteran quarterbacks that were starting ahead of them. The sitting and learning theory was a media-based developed theory, most notably by Colin Cowherd. Oh my gosh, he just keeps on bringing it up. Colin Cowherd, man, Colin, you got to move on from that. That it, it, it sounds smart, like I said, that, oh, yeah, you can sit on the bench and you can learn. You don't want to hurt their development. We treat these quarterbacks like they're a gentle, incompetent child. Like, oh, no, you got to be gentle with them. They're not ready. Oh, no, 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 don't, don't go in there just yet. No, 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 you're not ready. Like, uh. Listen, that's not true. And the reason why it's not true, let me give you an example. Kind of relate this to real life. Any skill or any job that you have, the only way that you're going to get better at it is if you actually do the job. Say, for instance, I worked at uh, Jimmy John's, okay? I made subs, and I worked at the slowest Jimmy John's in the world, all right? I only helped out one customer an hour. I know how to make a sub, but it just wasn't that fast-paced, and it wasn't that stressful. I get hired at Subway, get a new job. Same skill set, making subs. I know how to make a sub, but it's the busiest Subway in the world. Let me ask you this. What is better for my development? Going ahead and starting day one since I already know how to make a sub? Or shadowing someone for a whole entire year, seeing how they work, and then making a sub after one year? Answer is going to the fire and making the sub since day one. Because the thing is, I'm going to make mistakes. Okay, it's the busiest subway in the world. It's fast paced. I'm not going to be used to it. But guess what? Even for the mistakes that I make, I'm going to learn from my mistakes. And I'm going to fail and I'm going to get better at that skill and get better at my job. And I'm going to get used to the workflow. Yeah, shadowing someone. Yeah, you can learn some menu items, some tips and tricks about workflow and things of that nature. But you're really not going to learn a lot. You're not going to develop as much until you get into the job and you actually do the job. That works for any skill in the world. Any skill that you want to learn, do any skill a thousand times, you're going to get pretty good at it. Learn about a skill for about a thousand times or a thousand hours, you're only going to know so much. You're still behind in your development because you didn't actually do the skill. You have to learn how to actually perform the skill, not just reading and doing knowledge about that or getting knowledge about it, but actually doing the skill. For a quarterback uh, transitioning from college to the NFL, they already know how to play quarterback. All right, they already know how to throw the ball. They already know they have the physical attributes of playing a quarterback. Otherwise, they wouldn't be drafted into the NFL. What's the biggest thing you got to learn? The playbook? Yeah, okay, learn the playbook. If you're not if you haven't learned the playbook, yeah, you're not ready to play. But you have 5 months, 6 months, however long the offseason preseason is to learn the playbook. Okay? That's why I'm a big advocate for any quarterback to go out there as a rookie since day one and go out there into the fire and start and fail and learn from your mistakes because that's the only way that you're going to get better is to actually do the job. Not from sitting, not from holding a clipboard. You're going to learn some things here and there, but man, you're going to grow so much more as proven by the quarterback's names that I mentioned from actually playing. So the start or, or the sit and learn theory, dumb does not make any sense. People just go along with it because it's it, it sounds smart, like I said, and the media came up with it. And gosh dang, Colin Coward. They just go along with it, but they when you, they don't take the time to actually think and sit down and think, is this actually legitimate? Because it's not. It doesn't matter. Start your quarterbacks day one. Justin Herbert, he's going to develop. He's going to start with the majority of the season. And I promise you, in second or his second season, in year two, He's going to be much better because he started his rookie season and he wasn't 16 games behind going into year two. Man, I just went on rants. So many rants in this episode. But that just means that I am fired up to get to our next segment, 
fantasy football questions that we answer every single week based off the comments that we get on that YouTube starts and sets of videos that we uh, release every Tuesday. Starting with our first comment, this is from A10 Airsofter. So I have Will Lutz as my kicker. He has been tried and true so far. Should I swap him out this week for Jason Myers? Myers plays the Cowboys. Lutz plays the Packers. I would keep Lutz. I understand Breeze and that Saints offense has not been looking good. And Myers is in a much better predicament and offense with the Seahawks. But I still consider Will Lutz to be a top three fantasy kicker. So I would put your faith in Lutz given that he plays against Green Bay and what should be a shootout. And he might be getting into field goal range. The Seahawks-Cowboys game might be a shootout as well. But Lutz, like I mentioned, has been proven the top or the last three years to be a top three fantasy kicker. So I would keep my faith uh, faith in Lutz. It's not worth dropping Lutz to the waiver wire. If you want to pick up Myers and bench Lutz, and you, if you have that spot for an extra kicker, sure, go for it. Whatever makes you feel better, because I don't think that, May, that Myers is going to be bad against the Cowboys. I think he's going to do fairly well. But I, I would keep Lutz as my fantasy football kicker for the rest of the season. This next one is from Brad Morgan. What are your thoughts on Breeze moving forward? Do I keep him or drop him for Big Ben or Ryan Tannehill? I know that Breeze, like we talked about with Will Lutz, has not been looking good. I still have faith in him. I still think that he's going to turn around, and this could be the week against a uh, uh, what could be a shootout against Green Bay. But are you able to keep two quarterbacks on your roster? Because if that's the case, then I would just bench Breeze for the time being and start Tannehill, who has a great matchup against Minnesota. Tannehill has not been looking like he's been regressing since the uh, when he took over in Tennessee in 2019, so he is a good fantasy football quarterback. Uh, and if you want to start Tann- Tannehill this week over Drew Breeze, I would not be opposed to that. Uh, but I would try my absolute best to uh, keep both and go with Tannehill over Big Ben. This next one is from Kun Aguero. Aguero. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. T.Y. Hilton is a start. Are you sure? He's been non-existent week one and two with good matchups. Hey, I totally understand. I get the frustration with T.Y. Hilton if you're a T.Y. Hilton fantasy owner. I would start him. If you're in like an eight-team league or less, probably not. But if like in a 10, maybe 12, 14-team league, yeah, why not? Can you flex him? Sure, I would flex him. Hilton is in line to see more targets after that injury to Paris Campbell. Listen, Mo Cox, the tight end, is not going to get five receptions for 111 yards every single week. That's not going to happen. Even though Phillip Rivers loves his tight ends, that's not going to happen. Okay, Jonathan Taylor is going to be in the mix. Naheem Hines, if he doesn't believe in Jonathan Taylor, is going to be in the mix and getting those pass-catching receptions from running backs just because Philip Rivers loves to dump the ball off to running backs, but the main targets in Indianapolis is going to be T.Y. Hilton and Michael Pittman. If Michael Pittman is still available on your waivers, I would go ahead and pick him up if you can uh, afford to keep that extra roster spot for Pittman. But Zach Pascal, hes I know he got a touchdown, but he's not going to be the number two wide receiver. Uh, T.Y. Hilton is the clear-cut Number one receiver has another good matchup. Be patient with him. I would start T.Y. Hilton. I don't expect him to pop off and get uh, 150 yards for two touchdowns, but maybe six receptions, 80 yards. Yeah, in a PPR league, that'd be pretty decent. So keep your expectations low with T.Y. Hilton, but I do still view him as a start, and I base all these starts off of uh, starts and sits off of 12 team leagues. So uh, I, th- I still believe that T.Y. Hilton is a good start. Inside Out Media, another kicker question that we got. Blankenship or Koo? Young Way Koo all the way. I know I, I raved about Blankenship, about him attempting seven field goal attempts the last two weeks, but Koo in that high-powered offense with the Falcons that just seemed to break hearts. Koo is the way to go. YouTuber Solid Snakes 35 asks, got to ask, Waller or Gesicki? Thanks, guys. So Waller or Gesicki, I'm a big Mike Gesicki fan. I think that's made pretty evident for you guys that watch Time to Football for the last two years. 
And I do believe that this is the year that Gasecki Gasecki could be the next thousand yard receiving tight end in the NFL. He's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be this season. Could be next season, but he's going to be. He, he's that good. Uh, Darren Waller would be my start out of those because if you just look at the game that he had, oh my gosh, was it 16 targets against the New Orleans Saints? That to me tells me that Derek Carr, that's his favorite target. And I know that Gasicki is Ryan Fitzpatrick's favorite target, but that offense is much more productive uh, with Darren Waller than Gasicki. So uh, I'd go with the Raiders offense and with Darren Waller over Mike Gasicki as a start this week. We're going to answer a couple more questions. Stu904 asks, start Gurley. I benched him. He's done terrible past two weeks. Yeah, I would start him. In a dynamic and in a scenario and in a time like right now, in 2020 of the NFL, when in fantasy football, the running back position is so thin out there on the waiver wire, and it's so hard to get those good running backs, and there's so many injuries happening, yeah, start Todd Gurley. If you have great depth and you can afford to bench Todd Gurley, number one, I'm jealous of you. And number two, do it. You do you. But for a guy that got 21 carries last week and got 14 carries the week before and also scored a touchdown, looked good in week one, I would start start Todd Gurley. He's a solid, uh, or I was going to say wide receiver, running back two, that could be a flex play. So Gurley is the way to go. The Falcons are staying true to their word with uh, giving him 15 to 25 touches every single week. And that kind of volume that you need right there is good enough to be a running back too. So Gurley with a good matchup uh, this week, I would start Todd Gurley against the Chicago Bears. This last one is from Jose Alonzo. Cook or Goddard, full PPR, asking about Jared Cook. At tight end, I would start Jared Cook. Uh, I, I think Cook is getting to that level right now where he's going to be a top five fantasy tight end by the end of the season. So Goddard, on the other hand, he's a little bit too up and down. You know, because it could be Zach Ertz one week that has, that has a hot hand, or it could be Goddard the other week that has a hot hand, or it could be a week where none of them have the hot hand like it was last week. So Cook consistently has been great. He's been good in week one, was good in week two, and I think he's just going to continue that trend against his former team, another former team that he's facing, uh, the Green Bay Packers. You can expect Drew Brees to target Jared Cook, especially with Michael Thomas out, and Cook is... I would say probably a must start every single week. But that's pretty much going to do it for this week's episode of Time to Football. We appreciate you guys uh, joining in. If you guys are watching this up on YouTube, be sure to head over to iTunes, subscribe to us on there because if you don't want to watch a 45 minute to an hour long video up on YouTube, totally understandable. You can listen to us on the go, subscribe to us on there. Likewise, if you're watching this on or listen to this on iTunes, be sure to head over to YouTube, youtube.com slash time to football. Subscribe to us on there. We come out with much more content on our YouTube channel than as opposed to iTunes. So be sure to subscribe to us on there so you can stay up to date with all of that. Man, with all that said, thank you guys so much for uh, watching this video, staying tuned with us. Appreciate you guys that have uh, been interacting with us in this chat through this whole entire time. Um, yeah, appreciate you guys watching this video, listening to it, and I'll see you guys next week.